Okay, uh, thank you uh, for attending uh, the colloquium today. And um, uh, by all means, uh, come next week, come the week after. Uh, each of these is uh, terrific. And you can learn a tremendous amount. Now, today uh, we have a professor from uh, UC San Francisco, uh, and, uh, which is an actual medical school. So he, uh, even though he's a professor in the medical school, he's really a double E. And the reason is, if you're a double E, you can do everything. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, uh, his official title is Professor of Biochemistry and Biophysics, uh, uh, but as I mentioned, he uh, started uh, as an engineer at uh, SUNY, uh, State University of New York at Stony Brook, and uh, uh, then he, uh, somehow, he had some very good uh, student guidance, and they, they guided him for his PhD at UC San Francisco. And uh, uh, so, he's, he's been uh, rubbing elbows with the medical profession. Uh, for uh, quite a long time. Uh, he has other qualifications. For example, he uh, coaches a, uh, a little league in uh, Lego League Robotics, uh, which is interesting. And it, it currently, he is building autonomous sumo robots. So I thought these were the ones that are done uh, with uh, uh, open AI, with adversarial networks. And he says, no, these are actual physical sumo uh, wrestlers. And uh, so uh, he's going to tell us today about his adventures, and he's, he's just uh, won a, tr a big NSF center, essentially to create synthetic life. And so uh, this is something uh, that should be very interesting to us. And in the title, he ends the title with cell CAD, <coughs> so cell computer aided design. So it definitely uh, falls uh, within our bailiwick. Uh, let's uh, welcome Professor Wallace uh, Marshall. Well, thanks, thanks a lot, Eli. Could, could people in the back hear me? Okay, great. All right, so I want to talk about our efforts to try to get some control over the structure of living cells and why we want to do this. And I think there's a couple of reasons. But the first I just want to point out that when you're a kid and you learn about what a cell is, typically they teach you something like this. It's more or less amorphous blob with a water in it and some enzymes doing some biochemistry. And if you like biochemistry, that's fine, but otherwise it's relatively boring. And I think this kind of picture has turned away a lot of people from cell biology, which is unfortunate because actually I would think, I, was, I would argue that cells are much more machine-like than we give them credit. So when you look at high resolution as shown on the left, cells can have these very complex, um, really mechanical looking components where in many cases we don't know what they do. The surface of cells are typically covered with different kinds of sensors and actuators as shown in the middle. And then linking all this together, there's all kinds of really interesting, potentially interesting um, pathways where you have lots of molecules talking to each other, turning each other on and off, doing some kind of computation. In many cases, we don't actually know what, what they're doing. So I think what you could argue that rather than viewing the cell as an amorphous, watery bag of enzymes, it's probably better to view the cell as some kind of intelligent robot just at, at a very small scale. And so we would like to sort of pursue this idea of viewing the cell as, as a robot and for a couple of reasons. One is that there may actually be real applications in which you would try to take a cell and then reprogram it to do something that you want it to do. And there's certainly a, a very popular um, approach now in immunotherapy is you can take immune cells and by adding on a few extra sensors, for example, you can make that cell now attack a tumor. And so this is in the, the so-called CAR T cells and people are becoming very sophisticated in doing this where you add multiple sensors and you add logic that allows the cell to integrate those sensors. Um, but this is really just the beginning. In principle, there's many things you could try to do, especially in the medical realm, but also in biotech, if you could engineer cells to behave as robots under your control. Now, a lot of the things you would want to do with a cell, you could also do with liposomes or some kind of other synthetic artificial system. What's great about cells is well, that's different is, first of all, they tend to be they're self-organizing, self-replicating. So once you make one, you can get as many of them as, as you want. They're very small, and they're, they, in many cases, they're, they're more biocompatible than some of the artificial kind of particles that one might want to use. So there's a whole area of applications that one could try to do by, by engineering cells and getting some control over them. But there's also another reason to try to think about the cell in some kind of robotic context. And this has to do with um, thinking about basic cell biology, fundamental biology in a somewhat different way. So at some level, the idea is that within a cell, you've got all these molecules, all these genes, all these proteins, uh, um, all these RNA, all these things, millions and millions of potentially um, interesting variables that control how the cell is working. And there's ways to measure various ones of those. There's currently no technology to measure all of them at the same time, but we're gradually getting towards that. And what you'd like to do is be able to understand 
what, we, what you really care about is not those variables. What you care about is what the cell is doing. What is the behavior of the cell? Is it eating another cell? Is it attacking a cancer? Is it building a brain or, or what? So at some level, the goal of cell biology is to understand cell behavior in terms of the, mo of the molecular underpinning. That's really what we're all trying to do in this field. Currently, the standard paradigm in cell biology is shown at the sentence at the bottom of the screen, which is that we want to, people tend to say that molecule X is responsible for behavior Y, sort of one molecule, one behavior. And this doesn't really work, but, but it allows you to generate lots and lots of papers because you can mutate some molecule, mutate a gene, show that the cell no longer moves properly, and now you say, okay, this gene is important for motion. I'm not sure that really counts as understanding, but, it's just a lot, you, but you can accumulate lots of factoids like that. So the question is, how can we get beyond that? <coughs> and, the, and the real issue is that although we can generate lots of facts like that, well, if you put them all together, you still can't predict how the cell will respond to some new configuration. So if you change the levels of one enzyme or another, you really often don't know what the cell will do. And this has made it very hard to do things like you know, gene therapy, and even, even in metabolic engineering and biotechnology, it's extremely challenging. So we haven't, we haven't really gotten to predictive understanding. And what is the problem? And I think, I think many people would agree that the big problem is, is not that we don't have enough data. We can measure all these molecules, we can do all this RNA sequencing and genomics. Um, the problem is not a lack of data. The problem actually is that in biology we're drowning in data. There's just these huge data sets being accumulated every day. The, the amount of knowledge we have in terms of individual facts is going up exponentially. But we don't know how to go from that mass of data and synthesize it in such a way that we can predictively understand how the cell will behave. So the real problem is just drowning in data and not knowing how to jump from the level of our current description to the behavior that we care about. So then you can ask, well, is there any other field of, of human inquiry where we have a similar situation where there's lots and lots of details which collectively com combine together to give you a, a useful or interesting result? And I think what really, a really good paradigm here is computer science. So in your computer, you have a huge numbers of devices, transistors, that are ultimately giving rise to the computation. But what the user cares about is their Rome Total War control screen and what the, what the soldiers are doing to each other in this simulated um, environment. So the, so the final output of the computation. And so you might think, well, God, computer science must be impossible because how can you possibly jump from these millions of transistors to this behavior that you care about? But we know it is possible, and the reason it's possible is that it, you know, when you think about computer organization, we typically address it at several different hierarchical levels of organization. So you don't try to jump from the level of device to the level of the final program. Instead, you, you go from device to a gate level, then you go from gate level to a register level, computer architecture, and then from there you can think about how the computer is actually implementing some kind of algorithm or abstract computational structure, and then finally you get the actual thing you care about. And so if you want to try to predict what your program is going to do, you don't go back to the transistors and say, okay, this one's turning on, therefore this is going to happen in the program. You look at some intermediate level and see how the data is flowing, what states the thing is transitioning between, and so on. So the question is, can we do a similar thing in cell biology? Can we interpose intermediate levels of abstraction that would allow us to actually predict behavior without having to know every single detail that's going on at the moment? Obviously, the details are still giving rise to the behavior, but the question is, in terms of, of being able to think about it, could we potentially you know, ignore that by coarse graining out some of that in, into a more abstract intermediate model? If we could do this, the first thing is I think it would actually make cell biology much more understandable than it currently is, because then you can understand what a cell is doing by looking at the states that it's transitioning between and, and, and what's regulating that and so on. Also, in principle, there's a chance now you could actually program the cell, because right now we, we would have no idea if we wanted a cell to eat, eat some other cell, we wouldn't know what genes to turn on or turn off. But maybe if we understood how various states of the cell led to the eating behavior, and then we knew which molecules led to that state, now we could actually try to do predictive design of behavior. And then finally, this is really far-fetched, and I don't, I'm not going to say anything about it, <coughs> <coughs> but I think it would be really interesting if by building an abstract model of a cell, we could take some of what is known about the abilities of those abstract models in computational context and then say, okay, cells can discriminate among certain kinds of inputs, but others they can't tell apart because they're all within the same kind of formal language, something like that. That's far-fetched, and we're not really trying to do that at the moment. So the big question is, you know, in order to do this kind of representation, one, you know, we, I love the idea of, say, a finite state machine representation of the cell. We say the cell is in n different states, and then we understand about how it goes between them. The problem is, how do you define the state of a cell? 
And this is, I think, a, a, a becoming a growing problem in cell biology. It's, um, some people are tr will try to do it at the genomic level, looking at, at clusters of gene expression. There's various approaches one could take. So, th so the question is, you know, if you're looking at a cell, how do you decide what state it's in? <coughs> one way you could try to do this is to actually use the behaviors. To say, if cells can only do three or four different things, you could assign each of those to some kind of an output state and examine how the cell moves between those states. So we've had a project ongoing in the lab to try to understand behavior of cells and use the, the behaviors as a way to infer what states are there and then understand what kind of model leads to that. So this is the work of, of a student, a great student, Jacob Kimmel, and what he did was to watch some fibroblast cells moving on a dish and analyze their motion. So these are cells that, that move around the body and, and, and deposit um, um, uh, protein structure, structural proteins that, that give rise to tissues. And so, so the motion is part of what they have to do. So what he did was to record um, live images of thousands of cells and look at their trajectories and then featureize that. So look at things like you know, turning angles, persistence, velocities, and so on. And in the end, he had 79 features. And then you can do dimensionality reduction with principal components and, and so on, and then try to see how many states do you get in. Can you actually see nice, discrete, distinct states? Oops. And the, the result was that you don't see distinct states. So when he looks at these cells, large numbers of cells, Using T-SNE, so a dimensional reduction, which is very good at separating clusters some, to the point that sometimes it artifactually will do so. Even you, under those conditions, we don't really see distinct clusters. Can, can you expand the acronym? Yeah, so, so it, it's um, T, T distributed stochastic neighbor embedding. It's, it's one of these things that it's, it's sort of an unprincipled way of doing this. It, um, it's almost designed to make something look really good so it sort of spreads your data out and over, over a, a, a grid, no matter how many dimensions are, are there. Um, and then here we've applied one of several, you know, the various clustering schemes you can use. And the best you could do is shown here where really it's just arbitrarily giving cutoffs to what's otherwise a continuous space of possibilities. So, okay, that's a case where it's all one cell type. So maybe it's reasonable that it's all in the same state. But then even when Jacob looks at, um, at stem cells that are, being, um, that are differentiating into a series of states to give rise to muscle cells, <clears throat> what you see is that as the cells differentiate, you don't actually see different clusters in state space. Instead, what you just see is uh, as the cells occupy different regions of the same continuous um, region. So we don't see a really nice sort of finite state uh, model er emerging here. Also, it, you can look at how the... Um, the, the cells are moving around in this state space. So here, this, now we're doing principal components, so we're looking at linear combinations of, of the features that give you the, 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 that account for most of the variance. And what you can, so the arrows are showing how over time the cell evolves through this state space. And so there's actually some interesting things going on here. Clearly you can see that depending on what state you're in, it's predictive of what state you're gonna be in at, at a future point in time. And so then one really interesting, one basic question we wanted to ask is, does the system obey detailed balance or not? So this is, a, this is detailed balance comes from, from chemical thermodynamics. And the idea is that if you have several different states that you can be in, you can look at transitions between those states. And so at so it's steady state, the occupancy of all the states would have to be constant. But detailed balance is a further restriction, which is that it, for any given transition, you'd have to have equal rates of, of going forward and backward. And that's characteristic of an equilibrium system. You could, but you could also have, for example, something like a cycle where you don't have detailed balance, individual transitions only go one way, but everything still balances out, so you're still at steady state, but not at equilibrium. And what we find is that when we look at the transitions in this um, behavioral space, we see that detailed balance is, is clearly violated. So it's, it is behaving like a non-equilibrium system, which is not shocking that we know cells are burning energy all the time. They're clearly not equilibrium. And this is what we see. So we have a certain level of, of predictability. If we know where we are in state space, we can predict where we're going to be next. What we don't know at this point is how the various molecular players give rise to these transitions. So that's still a level that we haven't, haven't gone to. Okay, and this is just showing that even if you look at different cell types that are doing different things, and on the left we have sort of a, a, um, one of these fibroblast cells that just puts down material, and then on the right we have a muscle stem cell, and then in the middle we have a, a muscle cell precursor. You see different behaviors, but the region of, morph uh, of behavioral spaces that they occupy is basically the same in all three cases. So even though we know these are different cell types, what's different about them is not sort of where they are on average in state space, it's how they're moving around within that region. So there's some information there, but it's not really the way we thought it would be. It's not as though there are these distinct, separable states that the cell is in. <coughs> <coughs> 
Yeah, right. So okay, okay, right. So 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 the question. question? Yeah. So Dan's question is, is whether um, is, is that you're taking cells out of their natural context, dumping them down onto a dish, and then. Um, the question is how much of this sort of directionality that we see is because the cells are taking time to adapt to being on the dish. And we, we, I would say, you know, yes and no. So we gave them some time, but maybe it's not enough time. So I think that's still an open question. In general, you know, I'm becoming less, and I'll get to this later, I'm becoming less and less happy with growing cells in culture anyway. I think, you know, this question of it, you know, I, I've heard people say that trying to understand the behavior of a cell by looking at a cell grown on a culture dish is like trying to understand human behavior by watching people inside a burning building. You know, the, the cells are really unhappy and maybe they're not at all behaving in the way that they're going in the wild. The whole reason for using muscle stem cells is that there is actually a paradigm where you can culture the cells in, 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 in their natural context on a developing muscle fiber and watch them moving around. We actually didn't get to that point, but in principle that technology exists, uh, you know, and we have a collaborator who's able to do this. So that's, that's where we would like to go is really going to, in, to the native context, because I think there's, the burn-in is one of, one of the problems, but there's actually many problems with having the cells in this weird context. Yeah. Okay. So, it, so with that caveat in mind, certainly at least when we, in our hands, it doesn't look like a finite state machine. It looks like a continuous state space that the cells can sort of move around in. So then, well, maybe behavior is the wrong way to infer state. Maybe there's something else that maybe a little, is a little more direct or somehow more informative. So the other thing we thought about was what if you just look at the cell and examine its appearance? So if we look at not only the shape of the cell, but the shape of all of its internal components, that might be quite informative as to the state of the cell. And part of the inspiration for this comes from the medical side. So the, the, way, the way cancer is often still diagnosed is by a cytopathologist who will take a sample of your tumor and look at it under the microscope and they'll say, hey, this cell has a, a, a you know, the nucleus looks like a coffee bean, so therefore I think it's a certain kind of cancer we're gonna treat you with a certain chemotherapy. And that's incredibly successful, and so there's clearly information in the appearance of the cell that's telling you about what's going on inside. So we thought, well, maybe we can try to infer states based on looking at the morphology of the cell. And so my, my, my student Amy Chang did, did a really heroic experiment where she made this construct that lets you simultaneously image several different structures in the cell. So we can image the microtubule cytoskeleton, so this network of mechanical elements that gives the shell, cell its shape. We can measure the nucleus, which is where all the DNA is, and we can measure the mitochondria, which are the, the, the power generating organelles of the cell that generate this complicated ramifying network. <coughs> and we can image all those simultaneously in living cells so we can assess the morphological state as a function of time. And just looking at any given point in time, what, what you see is this incredible variety in the appearance of the cells. So this is, these are all genetically identical cells. These are mouse fibroblasts taken from a, from a, from a mouse. Um, they're genetically identical, they're all apparently supposedly doing the same thing, but they have really dramatic different sizes and appearances. So then um, what Amy did was write some software that could image these different structures and extract a number of you know, uh, different morphological features. I, and so in the end it was 205 different features, things like you know, how round is the nucleus, how dense is the, densely packed is the mitochondria, and so on. And you can look at individual pairs of, of features and ask which ones are correlated to each other, and some are and some aren't. And then ultimately though, what she did was principal components analysis, again, to reduce the dimensionality. And the result is that most of the variance is encoded in three principal components. And if you look at how, this is a subset of, of her cells, in the end there's a lot more data than this. But basically, the, again, you don't see discreetly separated clusters of, in, in this morphological state space. Instead, you see essentially a smooth continuum, continuous region where the cells can sort of fill out that region. And again, we look at the dynamics, ask, you know, if, if we know what state the cell is at a certain point in time, where is it gonna be 10 minutes or 20 minutes later and so on. And the result there is that now we see detailed balance is actually obeyed. So, <coughs> for, <coughs> sorry. For any given pair of, 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 of states, positions in, in the state space, you see balance transitions going both ways. So this starts to look like an equilibrium system even though we know the cell is not at equilibrium. And that got us thinking, well, to what extent can we push this analogy with thermodynamics? So what Amy did was to take the occupancy of, of the state space, where we know the probability of being in any given state, and represent that a different way as an energy landscape. So if basically, you know, if you use Boltzmann statistics, you know the probability of being in any state, you can convert that into you know, some sort of arbitrary uh, you know, abstract energy. So you get this landscape. It has all the same information as the occupancy does, so you aren't learning anything new by doing that. But if it was actually at equilibrium, 
then you should be able to predict the dynamics of the system by taking the gradient of that, of that landscape, right? So basically, whenever you have a steep region, the cells should be moving down that, down that steep side in state space. And remarkably, that's actually true. So when she takes this energy landscape and then differentiates it, that actually does predict, um, on average, which way the cells will be evolving over time. So here we see, um, on the left, the actual measured transitions, and on the right, the ones that are inferred from the energy landscape. Question. How do you know how you define this energy space? I mean, uh, there's so many different potential components yeah. that come in positive or negative with different weights. And so how did you get to a model that actually works like that? Yeah, so, so what we did was basically the, the most simple-minded what is that? Is that? That's a microphone. For the oh, I see. Okay. So, so to, okay. Sorry. Uh, so yeah. So so what we did was we, um, if we all in principle, if we knew what the temperature was, if we knew what the temperature was, then we could use both statistics. If we know the prob so we know the probability of being in every every possible state. So we just we bin it, and so then if you know the probabilities of being in all the states, those are given. By you know by e to the you know the, the different the difference in probabilities between two states would be proportional to e to the difference in energies divided by the temperature. So you can inf you can go back and infer all the energies if you know the, all the probabilities of occupancy. So so we don't need to really model anything. We can directly calculate it from the probabilities if we know the temperature. So if you change the temperature, essentially what you would do is is, is stretch the vertical axis of the of the energy landscape. So you can change the way it looks, but the minimum will still be in the same place. So, okay. But um, there may be internal pressure. There may be another factor. How does that figure into energy? Oh, yeah, right. I mean, so, so right, so, okay, so, so right, so, okay. So, in, we're, we're doing a very abstract energy here. So, the, so what we're calling an energy is just a, a, a number which, when you plug it into the Boltzmann distribution, gives you the probabilities of occupancy that we see. The actual physics of that is a whole other story. So. All these things, absolutely, the, you know, the, the mechanics of the cell will be contributing to this. The molecular events going on in the cell will contribute to this. So we, we're not decomposing it all into the actual source of this. So it's a, it's a, purely, it's, it's a purely abstract energy. So, that, so it raises the question of how do we ever come up with a temperature? Because the temperature is similarly an abstract concept. And you know, what we tried to do, the best we could do, so, so the best we could do was to, was to look at the magnitude of the transitions and say, well, if it was actually a temperature, the higher the temperature, the more you'd have, the, the bigger the fluctuations would be. So you could take, you know, the, the mean squared magnitude of the fluctuations, and say the temperature is proportional to that. Um, at the end of the day, we're left with this really abstract notion of temperature. We have the same problem that others. You know, um, James Glazier, for example, has done really nice um, thermodynamic models of tissue organization, where we're using mechanical models of cells, but ultimately he has to also infer an abstract temperature. Um, so this whole, uh, this whole question of how you define temperature when it's not a physically measurable system is, is really interesting, and I, I wish I, I need to think more about that. But for now, it's, we're sort of not doing what you want to do, which, but we would like to get there. Okay. So anyway, so what we see is that, again, it's not a finite state machine like we were hoping to see. It's a continuous state space. It's potentially understandable in some way because it acts as though it's a system at equilibrium, even though we know it isn't. Question. That is exactly the amazing part. Yeah. So for those who didn't hear yeah, the, the, the oh. all right, fine. Uh, so uh, in case I wasn't loud enough the first time, um, yeah. So you, you made an abstract model just using simple naive thermodynamics, let's call it. And the amazing thing is that that model does reproduce the observations. So therefore, you do have something. There must not be some confounding other factors. Never mind that we know that the cell is in fact quite complicated. So that's, that's the surprising part, I guess, what you're saying. Yes, and then absolutely. And we can all so sub subsequent observations can be now used. This is the baseline, which to, to, from which to subtract. Yes, and, and so for example, you know, we can now rephrase our original question as how do different genes affect the shape of the landscape? And we've done a little bit of this with drug treatment. Um, you know, th does it matter where, does where you are in this landscape determine whether you die when you hit, get hit with a chemotherapy agent and so on? So it's really, we have now a framework to think about what's happening. But the remarkable thing is that it works at all. The expectation was that it would not work. And so, I mean, the original vision I had was we were going to show how, how much this fails. And that was going to be our exciting conclusion. And so now we've sort of pivoted to the opposite. But um, 
But yeah, it, it's, uh, and so why all that works is interesting. You know, there is this, um, a lot of interest in, in, in active matter where you have materials made of energy consuming components. And depending on how you do that, it often will behave in a way that looks like it's at equilibrium. So for example, if you watch, this is sort of a long digression, but I hope that's okay. But if, if, you, if you measure particles that you put inside of a cell, say you wanna know the viscosity of cytoplasm. So you put a bead in, if you pull on it, you get one value for the viscosity. If you just watch it move around under you know, Brownian motion, you get a different value for the viscosity. And in general, you get a much lower value for the viscosity if you measure it based on the spontaneous fluctuations of the particle. And the, 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 the reason for that appears to be that there's all these you know, active processes happening in the cell that are moving that thing around. Because they're all random and uncorrelated, they look like thermally, you know, they lo it looks like you know, the Langevin forces of Brownian motion, but it's actually driven by, by you know, chemical energy. But it ends up looking like diffusion only with an artificially much higher temperature. So if you estimate the temperature of a cell, it's like the temperature of the surface of the sun or something like that. So th there's precedent for, th for the idea that you can have equilibrium-like behaviors even though you know you're consuming energy. But still, I was surprised that it actually worked, to be honest. Okay, so the general conclusion we're getting is, at least for, th for these cell types, a finite state machine, which I, I, you know, I've always loved that idea, a way of thinking about things, it's such a great way to build other more abstract models with a finite state machine plus memory, you get pushed down automata and so on. I really wanted this to be the analogy, but I just don't think it is, and it seems like it probably it's not the right language to discuss how these cells are behaving. And probably a better language would be something like dynamical systems where you can, you're now watching how the cell moves around in some kind of, of a phase space. And so now we can sort of realign our, our, our experiments based on this kind of conceptual machinery. So for example, we're now really thinking about cell behavior as a flow through some, th through some abstract space. And so one thing you can do is, you, you know, it, it typically in cell biology, we'll pick one cell and watch it move over time or, or change over time. So we're really watching sort of a particle moving through the state space. So that would be a Lagrangian view of dynamics. But there's other technologies coming out now where you can sort of ask how is every gene changing as a function of time? So you're actually watching how, how, you're, how every point in state space is moving at one snapshot. So that would be more of an Eulerian view of, of dynamics. So I think, I think sort of fluid mechanics may be a really good analogy for what's going on in the cell. Again, abstract. We're not really talking about physical fluid flow of the cytoplasm. And so in predicting behavior, I think we're gonna to have to go to these ideas from classical mechanics, actually, and try to use those. So that's what we're, one, one direction we're gonna go. So the question now is, well, if this is the right framework, so if it's not really a computational, traditional com computer science type of framework, something more like you know, classical physics, does that mean that the cell is not a robot? And as Eli said, you know, I'm, I'm, I've always loved robotics. It's sort of how I got into actually everything I'm interested in now. When I was a kid, I used to try to build things, and I've been coaching First Lego League. I really want cells to be a robot at some point. Um, it doesn't have to mean, so if something doesn't have a computer in it, doesn't mean it's not a robot. So um, you know, we, we, we typically think about robotics as being you know, based on computers and AI now, but that wasn't always the case. So in the early days, when, you know, really one of the first autonomous robots were, were Gray Walter's tortoises. So here's, here's Elsie. These are devices controlled by analog circuits, very simple circuits, no, no computers or memory. But the robot had a light sensor, it could steer, and it could, um, so it, it, would, it would basically go towards a light source, if it hit obstacles, it could maneuver around them. When it ran low on power, it could return to a bait station and recharge. A lot of the things you'd want an autonomous robot to do without any computers. And so here's just a picture of, 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 of Gray Walter with one of these things. And then uh, on the right is just a, um, a time-lapse um, photograph showing how the robot moves around and appears to avoid obstacles. And you could say, okay, it does all these sort of purposeful-like behaviors. But it's doing it all you know, in, in, a pure, in a purely analog way. And there's no, nothing like you know, what we consider to be a computer. There's no memory and there's no program. So I think you could argue that, in fact, this kind of analog-based robot really is probably a better analogy for how cells are behaving than your traditional program, you know, stored program, computer-based robot. And so now I'm getting really obsessed with this idea of making you know, combat robots that are only controlled by analog circuits. I can't explain why I want to do that, but I just think it would be cool. But nevertheless, so I think this is a good analogy, and, and so now we're going back and trying to read this old literature on these kind of you know, analog-based computations. Um, but the question is, well, maybe the cells we're looking at, are, for whatever reason, are just, are just on the analog side. Maybe there's other cells that might be a little bit more digital. And the thought process that we had is that most of the cells that we, and this gets back to this question that, that, that Dan asked, which is, you know, we take cells out of the body, put them on a dish, and they're doing something weird. But in the body, you know, most of the cells in your body are in a very controlled environment. They always know where they're gonna be. 
there's not a lot of surprises or novelty that they have to face. So the level of computational complexity is probably very low because they don't have to respond to anything. So we're thinking, well, what about free living cells? So on the right, I've show, I'm showing you two cells from the pond. The one on the left is paramecium, which is an innocent cell that swims around eating bacteria. And the one on the right is didinium, which is a predatory cell that will actually find paramecium, swim towards it, and eat it whole. And so it highlights the point that out in the pond, you have these free living cells. They can't rely on anybody else. And they're all trying to kill each other all the time. And so if one of them is better at doing computation, it's able to make better use of its sensory inputs, it's able to remember what's happened in the past and change course accordingly, it's going to have a survival advantage. So we were starting to think, well, maybe if you were to look at some of these free living cells, we might see some more overtly computational behaviors. And so it turns out this, this has actually um, um, worked. So in, in a, in a, over a couple of summers at, at, at Woods Hole, um, a great student from, from Berkeley, Ben Larson, who's here in the audience, you want to raise your hand so people can, um, started looking at this, at a cell that called Euplodes is able to walk. <coughs> so the thing on the upper right, it looks like a cockroach. <coughs> it's actually a single cell, and it walks using 14 little feet called cirri. And these cirri are basically, this pro is basically made of these tubes of protein that can bend by consuming energy. So these single cells will walk around, and here's a video, if I can get it to play, of of one of these cells running around, and see it, it goes to that particle and then walks over it and then it scampers around. So the nice thing about the cell, it's got these 14 feet, you can resolve them all. Any one of these feet is either moving or not moving. There's th th basically, it's, 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 a very, it's a very binary um, response from each of, the, each of the feet. So you can characterize the entire motility state of the cell with a 14-bit number. Basically, each foot is, either, is or is not moving. And so then by doing this for, for, for many, many time points, what Ben could do is do, um, in, in this case, dimensionality reduction by non-negative matrix factorization. Principal components also work, but just not as, as beautifully as NMF. And the result is that there's eight clearly separable, quite distinct, discrete states that the cell is in. So finally, we have some kind of a finite state system. So the question now is, well, how do you, does the cell transition among these? And so one thing that you could do is just ask about transition rates between these different states. And this is showing the transition matrix, which is um, clearly not symmetrical around the diagonal, meaning detailed balance is violated. So that's not surprising. It's non-equilibrium. And then you can look at transitions among these states. And, and what you see is that from any given state, there's a strong bias in terms of which state it's going to be in at the next point in time. So there's a, a, it's not completely orderly. There's some stochasticity here. But it's definitely much better than, than just purely uniformly distributed. So there's clearly some kind of logic guiding what's going on here. And so the question now is, what actually are the rules that are, that are controlling all this? All right, so what we'd like to know, for example, is you know, what makes the cell determine when to switch between states? So when does it change from walking this way to walking some other way? What, what are the molecules that define the states? So when it's walking one way versus another, what's actually, has it being implemented at the molecular level? And then ultimately the question is, can we learn enough to reprogram how the cell walks? Can we make the cell turn right when we want it to, for example? Okay. So the question becomes, you know, what is implementing all this computation? The answer is we don't know. But one idea that I love is that in some of the old work on the cell, it's been claimed that there are these long protein filaments that are connecting some of the feet together in very, very um, non-uniform ways. Maybe those are actually linkages that are ac that's such that when one foot moves, it will then cause another one to move. And the analogy that I really like is the idea, uh, those of you who have seen those Strand Beast sculptures where you have these mechanical things made of wood that can walk down the beach. It might be something like that. And the beauty is these cells are, are very amenable to dissection and ablation. So we can try ablating some of the linkages and asking what happens. OK, so, so I think in, le in at least some of these free living cells, they really are behaving in a way that's more like what we expect from a computational type of device. So um, in the time left, I want to just um, talk about our attempt. So that's all been focusing on the behavior of cells. But what about the physical structure of the cells? We know that these cells are full of these membrane-bound compartments in which different aspects of biochemistry are happening. So different reactions will occur in different compartments. So at some level, the cell is like a chemical factory where you have reaction vessels that are doing the chemistry. And the question is, could we change the biochemical function of the cell for biotechnology purposes if we could reorganize the physical structure of the cell? The problem is we actually don't know how to do that. So we have this project um, in, in, in the center that we're running, the so-called Cell CAD project, which is can we take the knowledge that we have and use that to make design tools where we could actually predict what molecular changes we should make in order to achieve a cell with a certain structure? The idea is that if you want a cell that looks a certain way, that is the different compartments, the different organelles have a certain size and shape, surface area, and so on, 
You would specify the cell by either drawing a blueprint or, 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 or writing down all the measurements that you want. And then in some kind of morphological space, like I talked about before, you would def define your design target as some point in that space. And the question is, how do you get there? So given a cell that would normally be in one, one configuration, you'd like to reorganize the cell to change its structure so that now you can make the cell make more of some high value chemical product, for example. That, that's the ultimate goal. And the challenge is, how would we know what perturbations that molecularly we should turn, what knobs should we turn to get you to some other point in this morphological space? So we have two strategies that we're pursuing in parallel. I mean, and basically, I'll just say right now, we don't know enough of biology to know how to do this. It's not intuitively obvious how to do it. And our idea is that there's so much complexity here, we're going to ultimately need software to help us do this. And so that's just to say a computer-aided design of a cell or, or cell CAD. So there's two approaches to do this. One is what we call the model-driven strategy, which is many people, including ourselves, have made sort of coarse-grained models for cellular dynamics, how different organelles change and, and, and how the cell grows and divides. From those models, if you given a set of parameters, you could predict the behavior of the cell and ultimately try to predict what it would look like. And this is something that we do a lot of in my, in my group. And what we would hope to now is to go one step further, which is if you want to achieve a certain morphology, so a certain space, a certain position in this design space, could you actually invert the model, use the model to determine what parameter values it would take to get you there? Right? And so, so fortunately, this is, a, this is, I think, a very uh, you know, pretty well-studied problem. There are many people here who have probably thought about this. Um, in our group, uh, I mean, at UCSF, Hannah El Samad, my faculty colleague, has thought a lot about how to design biological systems. And, and basically, the idea is that there's probably many different parameter combinations that will give you the, 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 the solution that you want. So what you can do is start with a few you know, sample parameter space sparsely, get some idea of solutions that work, and then you go around each of those solutions and explore locally, the, uh, you know, vary the parameters in, uh, in some symmetrical way around each point, and then you stitch the solutions together, and that will give you some kind of manifold of all the parameter values that would be a real solution. And then we would go into the lab and try to make lots of possible strains that would sample that, that curve in parameter space. So that would be a, a strategy, but you have to have a model. And it turns out that many things in, bi in, in cell biology at, at sort of the biochemical pathway level have been modeled. There aren't that many models for actually the, the size and shape and structure of the, of the compartments themselves. It's been an underexplored area. So we did, so one thing we did for, uh, you know, how do we get the models? So the goal is to have models for all the components of the cell. One thing that we tried this past year was we had a hackathon for, um, um, hosted by, by John Duber from, here from Berkeley, trying to build a model for the peroxisome, which is just one of these organelles in the cell. And one conclusion that we, that we reached while, ma while doing this process was that, in fact, there's a limited number of things that these cellular compartments can do. And so maybe we could start, step back, and make a framework for modeling and say these are all the possible things that a cellular compartment can do. Each one of those leads to a term in some differential equation. So if you knew which of these steps were happening, you could stitch them together and build a model sort of with a click of a button. So what we have in mind is for a given, you know, these membrane compartments, they're rough, you know, spherical, membrane-bound, um, chambers, what could they do? Well, they could grow by pumping material in. They could grow their surface area by just adding um, lipid to the membrane. They could, they could do fission, so now you have two of them, but they're smaller. You could bud pieces off. You could fuse pieces on. That's more or less it. So there's a limited repertoire of events that could happen. We can, in principle, model each of these things, and then for any given organelle, we can say, which ones does it do, and then plug in terms to build our model. So um, this is something that we're actively pursuing. Simone Bianco at IBM Almaden is, is, is taking the lead on this. And we think this is one approach for trying to build a, a CAD system. We're going to hit an ultimate problem, though, with this model-based approach. So once we have all our models and we do our, our, our model inversion to get the parameters that we want, now the problem is how do we go from those parameters to actually making a physical cell that embodies those parameter values? And if you look at these typical biochemical models, you, know, you typically have these proteins that are essentially um, bio, um, biomolecular catalysts. Most of the parameters have to do with the behavior of those proteins. So how, how well do they bind their substrate chemical? How rapidly do they convert it to some other chemical? That, that sort of thing. So if we have a gene shown by this box with an arrow that encodes a protein shown by the structure there, there's really three different things that, could, that one could do that would change values of these parameters in the model. One is, uh, I'll show on the top, is you, maybe you can make a point mutation, so change one little piece of the protein that would change its biochemical function in some predictable way. You could also just delete the gene from the genome, as showed in the middle, or you can make the cell make more of, of the protein. Those are really the three things that you can do. Many of the parameters in our models are of the first type, that is, they have, they would, the, the thing you want to change 
has to do with how well the protein does what it does. And the problem is that changing the enzymatic activity of an enzyme is an extremely difficult challenge. So this whole field of protein engineering, there's labs, this is all they do, is try to make an enzyme that behaves in some different way. It can be done, but it's extremely difficult. It's not by any means a turnkey um, process. So I would characterize this kind of parameter change as possible but not feasible. Whereas getting rid of the gene or overexpressing it is, is easy. And so these kind of parameter changes are easy to do. We can do them in a high throughput way with automation and so on. So now I think there's a, there's a whole new research question which has been launched by this effort, which is to ask how much of the parameter space that, we're, that we care about can actually be assessed just by the, the latter two processes, that is deleting genes or overexpressing them. If that's all we can do, does that limit us in, in, our, in, our, how, in our ability to span parameter space or not? And I think that's still actually an open question. So that's a research goal that we're currently starting to engage with. Meanwhile, though, we have we devised a different, uh, entirely different strategy for doing cell CAD that would basically avoid this problem entirely by thinking about the design problem solely in terms of the actual perturbations that you can actually do. Okay, sorry. So yeah, so so the idea here is what we call the data-driven strategy. We can do all kinds of perturbations in the lab. We can mutate genes, we can add chemical inhibitors, and so on. And each of those, we, we can observe what happens to the cell. And so at some level, we can characterize any molecular perturbation as a displacement in our morphological space, right? So you knock out some gene, image the cell, and ask, what's changed? Has the nucleus gotten bigger, or what? So the idea then is that if you wanted to achieve some displacement, overall displacement to a new morphological state, a new structure of the cell, maybe you could just do it by combining some of the perturbations that you've directly seen. And the beauty there is you know how to make each of those because you, you've, you've actually measured the perturbation, you know, the response to a molecular perturbation that you did in, empirically. So this would be an sort of an empirical approach just done by having lots and lots of data. And the beauty is now with, the, with automation, we can easily image you know, huge numbers of cells in, in, you know, in, in, in multi, you know, we get a plate with you know, 384 different perturbations, let it go overnight, and the next day we have this massive data set of these kind of perturbations. So the data's there, what do we do with it? So it raises a couple of questions. Um, the first is whether organelles can be, you know, the cellular structures can be individually addressed. That is, can particular mutations affect just one of them, or, the, or, or how intermixed are they? And then the other is, to what extent is the space a, a, a linear space? That is, can you combine these displacements in a predictable way just by adding them? All right, so first we want to ask about this, this um, individual addressability, because maybe we don't need CAD software at all. If we could take each organelle and say there's a given gene that when we alter, that when we mutate it, it just affects that one organelle, then we don't need to think about how we would combine them, right? We would just, if we wanted to change two different organelles, we would change one, then change the other, and just combine those two mutations, and we would get the expect expected value. So if organelles are really individually addressable, there's really no need for CAD software, and, and life will be good, but maybe not as much fun. So the question is, are organelles addressable or not? So now we go back to this state space reconstruction that, that I showed you before from Amy Chang, looking at lots of morphological parameters. And it turns out that when, you know, I, I mentioned that there's three principal components that contain most of the variability. If you go in and look at those components and ask which organelles contribute to each of those components, it turns out that each component has major contributions from all the organelles in the cell. So, they, so at least by principal components analysis, they, they don't cleanly separate into different groups. So based on this, we would say that um, that the organelles are not individually addressable. This is based on, of course, spontaneous variation in a, in a population of cells, not actually applying a perturbation. So the other thing you could do, which, which, which Amy Chang also did, is to take cells and treat them with various highly specific chemical inhibitors that we know just target machinery that regulates one organelle and not, not the others. For example, here's, an, here's um, a, a small molecule that inhibits the, um, the, the, um, the fission and fusion dynamics of mitochondria, but it's very specific to that organelle. And yet, as shown on the right, when you look at the parameter values of, that describe the shape of various different organelles, it's not only the mitochondria shown in red that's affected. Also, the nucleus is affected, and also the, the, the shape of the cell, the distribution of microtubules, and so on. So again, with these highly specific inhibitors that we know biochemically are just targeting one organelle, we see effects on all the other organelles, implying, again, that they're not individually addressable. They're too interlinked to be able to change them in this simple way. So. We can't simply um, just combine mutations in, in, a, in just in, in an obvious way. Nevertheless, it, it's still possible that we could um, do some kind of, you know, if, if the vectors will combine in a linear way, we can still achieve a design goal by combining perturbations. So the question is, is this a linear space or not?
So to try to get at that, and, and, and we're still in the early days of this, but one thing that we've tried doing is um, we had a data set which we'd gotten in collaboration with Davide Ruggiero at UCSF where we take fibroblasts, so normal healthy cells, and then we can put in either one or both of two genes that drive cells towards a, towards a, towards a cancer-like phenotype. So, the, so basically, if you put in both of these genes, these cells become really malignant. You can inject them into a mouse and it will get a tumor. And then we measure four different structures, the nucleus, the nucleolus, actin, and mitochondria. Again, so we can, then we can measure different shape features. And so the result, here's, um, here's a plot of just a couple of these parameters. Um, each point is a cell. The colors tell you um, which kind of cell it is. So the unperturbed wild type cell is the red one it can control. The two, if we just put in one gene or the other, so the single, single gene modified versions is green and blue. And then in kind of the, the, the brownish pale green is the double combination. And what you can hopefully see, it's kind of hard to see depending on how you plot it, it's definitely not the case that the combination of the two is just the sum of the two individual ones. However, the combination of the two is distinct from either of the, of the individuals. And so Vito Pastori and Simone Bianco's group at IBM has, has been able to make classifiers that can distinguish the double from the singles. But, the, but clearly, you can't just sum them up. All right, so the bottom line is that at least for these two perturbations, they do not combine in, in a linear way. Now, you could argue, if, if you, you know, for the aficionados, these genes happen to affect a lot of targets, so maybe they're the wrong ones to try. So we're going to try this now systematically for many, many pairs of, of mutations. But assuming this is the result, um, we cannot just simply combine things in a linear way. Does that mean that we're dead? Not necessarily. It just means that we need to learn how to combine these perturbations in some way. So we're, so what we're, we're kind of hoping that, and this is, again, may or may not work, but we're hoping that we could use machine learning to, to build a system that will actually predict what happens when you combine these perturbations based on, on large numbers of experiments like this, which we can easily do. And the question be, will become, you know, do we have to do every single thing experimentally, or is there any predictability here? At this point, it's an open question. So you know, I, I don't know what to say. We're scientists, and we, we, we could just be wrong. But this is what we're trying to do. So hopefully, and, and so one other possibility is that we're also pursuing this model-driven approach can we combine sort of the domain knowledge that we get from those models with the data that we have, and maybe the combination of the two would be more powerful than either approach by itself? This is what we're trying to do in our center, and maybe it'll work, maybe it won't work. Even if it doesn't work, we're certainly learning a lot. We never would have done these experiments that we did in terms of individual addressability and, and nonlinearity if we hadn't had this goal in mind. So at the very least, it's useful in terms of driving our basic research. All right, so I just want to um, acknowledge the, the people whose, whose, whose work I showed. Most of the work I showed was um, two students, Amy Chang and Jacob Kimmel, and then also the, the work of the walking cell was the work of Benjamin Larson, who's luckily going to be joining my lab as a postdoc in a couple of months. So I'm very excited by that. We've had a lot of great collaborators who have been helping us. Um, our work has been funded by the NSF through our Center for Cellular Construction, and also recently we've started to get funding from the Fondation Formatin Gilbert, um, have this I2 cell program trying to apply computer science concepts in biology. So I really want to thank all of you for attending and Eli for giving me the chance to come here and talk to you. I'll try to answer any questions that you may still have. Thanks. Well, I must say, I find that blue cube super intimidating. I keep looking at it. No, we're going to throw it to whoever has a question. OK, here you go. Ah, now I get it. OK. Oh, that's cool. Um, uh, so I'm curious why, oh yeah, like this? Talk to the box. I'm curious why you would expect things to have uh, linear uh, responses in the first place. It seems to me like if anything you'd expect their dynamics to be linear, but like that your endpoint measurements after some amount of time is a lap, right? Like, so is yeah. there some way of resolving whether that's really the issue? Yeah, I think so. First, in terms of the, of the question of why we would expect it, we wouldn't expect it. We, we sort of, we're sort of working our way down what outcomes would make our lives most easy. And you know, the most easy would be if they were individually addressable. And then the second most easy would be if they were linearly combinable. There's no rational reason to think that they would be. I like your point that it, it could be that you know, individual dynamic events are linear, but then they sum up and the endpoints are not. Um, and in principle, we could do that because we could watch the dynamics of the singles and double perturbations in the same state space and ask how they work out and you know, how, how similar they are, how they interact with each other. That might be a way to get around. Yeah, the endpoint end is always tricky, right? Because it's, you could have you know, small differences lead to huge differences at the endpoint. I like that idea a lot. <laughs>
But yeah, we had no reason to think it would work. Okay, I, I, uh, let's see, a question here. Okay. Um, hi, it seems uh, you're focusing on observable uh, parameters, uh, things you can image uh, under the microscope. What about uh, those uh, unobservable uh, parameters, such as uh, you know, cyclokines uh, cell will be secreting under different conditions, and there are <coughs> a lot more of those unobservable parameters? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, one way to do all this would be to focus entirely on, on at the molecular level and, and try to measure everything. And we haven't really tried to go that route because even though there's technology that can measure lots of things, first of all, there's no way to measure all the things you'd want to measure simultaneously. Now, there could be key elements that are super predictive, and you could just measure those if we knew what, th what those were. The other problem is that many of the assays are destructive, and so you can't watch the cell over time. So we like observables that we can do in a non-destructive way, but still the question is, you know, the observables are not the same as the underlying system that's driving them, right? So imagine we were given Gray Walter's tortoise, you know, this analog robot. Could we infer the circuit controlling it just by how the thing moves? And I think you could argue maybe you could not, um, but maybe you could. And so the question is, how would you do that? So there, there are techniques out there. So one that we're really interested in is this idea of causal state reconstruction from, from, from Crutchfield and Shalizi, where you basically um, try to, um, t you start with observables and then you cluster observables, which are observations which are predictive of similar future, future outcomes. And then you say, okay, if given a certain observation, you get a certain kind of outcome, they must all have been in the same state. So it's a combination of your current observation and then the future behavior of the system. And from that, you can infer sort of causally relevant states. Um, going back to relate those to actual molecular events is a whole other challenge, but I think that's probably a better way to do it than our current approach, which, as you say, is basically equating the behaviors with the states, which I think is actually not the right thing to do, as, as you correctly point out. I was fascinated by the uh, um, technique that you described earlier in the talk, where you have a cell which is a very, very complex system. You don't understand all the details, can't even measure all the components, but nevertheless, you introduce some kind of abstract energy or maybe um, uh, temperature, and then looking at that, you can actually predict what's going to happen. Now, could this technique be applied to something that's much, much more complicated, like to a whole human? for instance. And so we know that humans, you look at them and you can tell them whether they're healthy or not, and their body language, uh, what they're are doing right now may infer what they're going to do next. And so it would be an interesting technique to see whether for something so much more complicated, you can use the same technique and do you get predictable results. So it's almost like a test of that particular technique. Yeah, no, I, I like that. So I mean, there's a, a, there has been some work with looking at um, the behavior of little animals like worms and so on, where you watch them crawl and then you try to classify their behaviors at, at, and see which behaviors typically precede other behaviors. So, so to some extent, we're actually being inspired by, by that application. You know, in the human realm, you know, we like to believe that we have free will and that, that determines what we'll do. But yeah, how simple, I think in general, I like this idea of always going for the simplest possible way of explaining something and just seeing how much predictability you get even if you know it's much more complicated un underlying that. Um, and you know, it's also, th th in terms of you know, things like diagnosis or medical prediction, at some level, you know, you, as long as it works, you don't necessarily care why it works. And so again, you know, if you have something simple that actually allows predictability, that's, that's kind of what, what you want. And I think the same is true for engineering cells. So you know, if we come up with some way where we could predict how the cell will change its structure, it would be an interesting question to ask then, why does that work? But, but as, a, as a parallel, we could start using that already to do useful things. I guess my bottom line is that maybe cells are not just like little robot. Maybe they're like little humanoids. Amen, yes. I, I really, so you know, okay, this is my, so you, you've invited the philosophical di digression, which is, you know, it's not obvious to me why having a certain number of neurons suddenly confers the ability to do thought-like processes. And, you know, why do we think a dog thinks? At some level, the way we think, a reason why we think, I mean, I, I believe my dog thinks. I believe it by watching my dog and the fact that he responds to things in a way that makes sense if I believe he's thinking. If I were to try to understand my dog by, by, by measuring every neuron in his brain, I would never be able to predict what, what he does, but I can actually now predict and control my dog's behavior by, by assuming that he can think. 
And the question is, how far down can you go? And you know, certainly at the level you know, of small little worms, in many cases, they can learn, they can make decisions. It's, it's, they're, in many respects, thinking, you know, who knows whether they're conscious, that's a whole other question, but their behavior certainly is easiest to explain if you assume that they are thinking in some way. And the question is, becomes how many, how many neurons or how many cells do you need to be able to do that? Maybe all you need is one. And there are many single-celled organisms that do very you know, interesting behaviors where if you didn't know it was a single cell, you'd assume it was a tiny animal with a brain. And so you know, I think cognitive scientists don't really like this idea, but I still think maybe there's thought that's sort of intrinsic to all living matter. Uh, so uh, there is sort of a uh, cultural problem in dealing with the, uh, your colleagues at UCSF, many of whom are doctors, and you sort of contrast that with uh, uh, the approach that uh, you're describing. Uh, uh, for example, you like to work on cells. The great thing about cells is that they're so small, you can collect a huge amount of data. And uh, so now you're in the world of big data, and we have statistical uh, ways of approaching that. Uh, wh what about the cultural barrier between someone like yourself who's, who's looking at things more mechanically and mathematically uh, versus the uh, medical professionals who uh, uh, are around you all the time? I mean, I, I think there's a huge trend in medicine now towards using big data as a tool, right? So this whole, you know, precision medicine where you try to collect all these medical records and then make inference based on that. So I think in terms of, uh, when it comes to the big data side of things, I think there's, there's no conundrum. Everyone's kind of going on to, in that same direction. In terms of the need for mechanistic understanding versus just empirical prediction, there's always gonna be some tension about that. Like, you know, you know to a certain extent, when I go to, you know, if, if I go to my urologist to get a kidney stone removed, I don't want him to be making some mathematical model. <laughs> I want him to get the damn thing out. So, you know, so I, I think there's, 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 there's clearly two different agendas there. Yeah. But in, on the other hand, you know, when there's cases that you don't know what to do with, it would be great if you have enough fundamental understanding to know what to do. And so I think there's an appreciation in the medical side for the value of basic knowledge. And UCSF is very strong for that, actually. Okay, let's uh, thank Wallace again. All right, thanks, everybody.